The United States is engaged in nuclear brinksmanship with a reclusive despot whose regime is determined to develop nuclear weapons and missiles to deliver them to the United States. Today's guest argues that the American public isn't worried enough about these issues. He's Matthew Galt, this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me, as usual, is my friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to understand the power of storytelling in American public life, whether those stories are told in print, on film, or in any other medium. Today, we're joined by Matthew Galt, a journalist who has spent considerable time looking at and reporting on America's atomic culture and the power of stories about nuclear warfare. He's also the host of the War College podcast, a show about conflict with a focus behind the front lines. Matthew, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you all for having me. So when we were talking earlier, you said uh, that uh, the American public is not afraid enough of the nuclear dangers that it faces. Right. Let's, let's spin that out for, for the audience. Well, I think we are learning to be afraid again, unfortunately. But uh, we live in an era where we are removed by several decades from the only atomic explosions that we've ever seen. And we don't understand how these weapons work. We don't understand how they function or how deadly they can be. Not anymore. Uh, and for kids of my generation, I was born the early 80s. Um, we didn't live under the threat of nuclear Armageddon. We didn't live through the Cold War in quite the same way that people that are older than us did. And we've, we've forgotten. We didn't grow up with a robust atomic, you know, scare stories in, t in television and movies. But yet yeah, you didn't grow up in that, but you are sensitized to this, to this danger, these threats. Why? Um, because I was a horror fiction fan growing up and I studied fear. And you can't look at American pop culture and the things that we are afraid of and separate that from nukes. It permeated everything after World War II up until the present day. Uh, you know, so many, so many creature features of the 50s and 60s are about, uh, you know, ants or other bugs or, or things that are exposed to radiation and, and, and go bad. Godzilla, right? Godzilla, right. perfect example. Uh, you know, 1979 China syndrome, not about nuclear weapons specifically, but still the dangers of, of, of nukes. It was a huge movie at the time. Um, effectively killed the nuclear power industry in the United States. It, well, that and combined with Three Mile Island, mm -hmm. which, which followed shortly after and then just terrified everybody, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that's, that's why I'm sensitized to it. And, and I started to look at and report on the way nuclear pop culture has shaped uh, our, our, our policy, specifically in America. Uh, and it's really fascinating, kind of the, the interplay. And it's something that we have lost recently that we are beginning to regain, I think, because we are afraid of the people in charge again. Mm -hmm. So a child of the 80s and you become interested in this field, how did you, uh, how did you educate yourself on that era and on nuclear issues in general? I and mean, where did you go, uh, libraries, movies, all of the above? I started with a book uh, called 15 Minutes, and the author's name escapes me, but it's just kind of about, uh, it's a very brisk read about American nuclear policy up through the 90s. Uh, and from there, then I just started to look and see what pop culture you know, were we, were we looking at and, and what kind of movies were we producing? What frightened people? What still resonates? So you look at things like Threads and The Day After, because we, we made, America and Britain especially made hundreds of movies about nuclear weapons and nuclear disasters. Some of them were abstracted, like the creature features I spoke of earlier, and others were very real and very frightening. Um, and talking to people, talking to people smarter than me, talking to people like Jeffrey Lewis, uh, Tom Nichols, who you've had on the show mm -hmm. before, uh, and finding the sources of information. And that's how I educated myself. So I think you're right. People are not scared enough. 
talk to the people who are perhaps don't understand what nuclear weapons can do and what nuclear warfare would be like in, in graphic terms as best you can. This is not just conventional weaponry. This is a whole different order. No. Um, you know what? I will use an abstraction from recent pop culture to start this. Uh, Game of Thrones, the recent season, there's an episode where Danny unleashes her dragons. And there's imagery in there of, of the bodies of these soldiers after the dragons have laid, have laid waste. Um, and it's just ashes. That's all that's left. That is a tiny fraction of what we are talking about here. And that's just the blast zone, right? So you have the, the middle of wherever the bomb strikes where flesh is atomized. Uh, and then you start to move out and people get sick uh, flesh melts. Uh, if you're looking, if you're too close and you're looking at the blast, your eyes are going to explode in your head and you're going to look like um, the Nazis at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, and if there are enough nuclear weapons used in any one location, society doesn't recover. Um, the Pentagon has done studies on this. They've looked at what they think will happen in the aftermath of, of sustained nuclear bombardment on the United States. We're not talking about something we get knocked down from and, and recover from. This is, this is civilization ending. This is, there's no iPhones tomorrow. This is, we have to learn how to farm again, but the soil is rotten. And it's generations of, of scrabbling back from, from nothing. How many nuclear weapons are there in the world? Tens of thousands. Tens of I thousands. Can tell you that. Tens uh, of thousands. Between the between Russia and the United States, in terms of what they have, it's a smaller number that's deployed, uh, uh, and and there's difference between strategic nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, China has uh, several hundred. Uh, other countries: Israel, France, the United Kingdom, India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. North Korea, which is really how we got to this conversation today, because the United States is engaged in a new round of nuclear brinksmanship, absolutely, uh, with an unstable power. Um, you, uh, you've, you've looked though through your research uh, and through your reporting uh, at a whole range of those of, of nuclear issues facing the United States right now, um, and, and one of the things that you've written on is the is uh, and you've reported on is America's nuclear modernization. Right. Uh, the United States is spending billions of dollars to modernize its nuclear forces. What does the public need to know that maybe they don't know about that project? This is really interesting because it's uh, it's. Information that's just kind of coming to light now. Uh, and you hear a lot about the reduction of the amount of nuclear weapons, which is true. Uh, something that started under, under, well, something that's been going on for decades, really, is both Russia and America, the two big powers, have been reducing the amount of nuclear weapons they have. But at the same time, those weapons are being modernized. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is we have fewer weapons, but those weapons are far more deadly than they used to be. Um, and what's really frightening to me is that we are now having public policy discussions in the Pentagon about things like dial a yield nuclear weapons mm -hmm. uh, and tactical and nuclear and weapons. And dial a yield is you can basically uh, select the uh, size of the explosion, That's correct. to put it in really basic terms, uh, uh, based on what you think the target is. And it, am I right in thinking that the, the principal concern in this is that you're making nuclear weapons more usable? You're making them more attractive. Uh, for a long time we lived in a world with some weird tangents uh, with people like Curtis LeMay, but it's a whole another story, where nuclear weapons were seen as uh, something that was only used in the last resort if someone else was using nuclear weapons against mm -hmm. you. They were used to, to keep the world at peace, which is a really bizarre you know, way to put it, but it's true. You don't want to start a war with somebody that has the power to, in 10 minutes, destroy your entire civilization. Mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction, exactly. But now we're getting to a point where we can do pinpoint strikes from you know a stealth submarine uh, and do a small tactical strike with a nuclear weapon and you're right it makes them more attractive and if you have a weapon um, you want to use it right 
And you why if you're at total war if you're engaged in total war with someone, uh, why not use every available tactic and weapon that's open to mm -hmm. you? Uh, and that's what's frightening about you know we say nuclear modernization. That's what's frightening to it. Uh, that that is what is frightening about it to me, uh, is that it makes these weapons more attractive and it makes people start even to think about using them. I think is is abhorrent. So in this country, what is driving this effort? Who is driving it? Is it the Pentagon? Is it members of Congress? Is it the president? And then the bigger question, why? Uh, I mean, there's good reasons to modernize America's nuclear capability. A lot of, especially if you look at uh, the missile silos um, that are kind of scattered out throughout the country, there's a lot of problems. When your, uh, when your computers are running on floppy disks, and I'm not talking the small 3.5s, I'm talking the big, you know, the original the floppy, original disks, floppy yeah. disks. Um we need some upgrades. Yeah. Uh, and Wait, there's hold also. Hold on one second. What is running on floppy disks from the 80s? The, uh, from the 70s. From the 70s. A lot of the, the missile silos, uh, the ICBM silos, yeah. they're still using 70s and 80s technology in them. Oh. Really? We've really focused on uh, the submarines and the stealth, kind of the stealth launched nuclear missiles, and the silos have been very neglected. Uh, and there's been a number of scandals that have kind of rocked the people that work in those silos specifically. They've, they've got cheating on some of their, they were caught cheating a few years ago on some of the exams they used to, to, um, to keep them ready, to make sure that they know what they're doing, uh, which is a whole other tangent topic. Like but yeah, there, yeah, needs to yeah. Be, there needs to be money put into these weapons to keep them up. But what has happened is, uh, well, while we're in there, you know, as we're bringing things up to speed, we may as well make them more deadly and more frightening. Uh, and I think that it's mostly driven by, I think Congress and until recently the pre well, until recently both Congress and the president were kind of removed from these concerns, uh, or at least in terms of the way the public perceives it, and it was uh, the Pentagon. Yeah. And I think there's a larger, there's a much larger conversation to be had about America's relationship with the military uh, and how we allow um, we kind of give them whatever they want, and we don't ask too many questions. So there was a quid pro quo in this too. The the there was a, one of the last things I worked on in Washington in 2011 was uh, the New Start Treaty, mm -hmm. and the New Start Treaty was predicated on uh, was was ultimately ratified with an agreement and an understanding that yes, we would ratify the the New Start Treaty. The Senate would ratify the New Start Treaty. But the Obama administration would then commit to the number that sticks in my head is like eighty billion dollar yep. modernization program uh, for nuclear for nuclear warheads. One of the reasons that that there's so much concern now, though, is as we said, is because of uh, President Trump's um, rhetorical flourishes with uh, with North Korea and Kim Jong Un. And there are some people who look at this and say, well, this is just the madman strategy. Right? right. That 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 he's he's trying to act crazy so that Kim Jong Un thinks he's crazy and then American deterrence is more likely to work, we're more likely to get the kind of diplomatic solution that we want. More uh, uh, some people though are concerned that it's not a madman strategy, it's just a madman. Um, where do you come down in this, and what do you see happening in this in this nuclear brinksmanship with with North Korea? Um, I think that North Korea is a more rational actor than people think that they are. Um, I think they're pursuing nuclear weapons for the exact same reason that any country pursues nuclear weapons, uh, especially one that's a essentially a military dictatorship that's been in power for three generations. Mm -hmm. You don't last that long and not know what you're doing, uh, especially on the international stage when you effectively have almost no allies and your, the people that are your friends have deep problems with you. Uh, with Trump, it's, it's classic madman. You know, uh, is, he, is, he is he mugging for the cameras or is he actually you know, what is our deepest fear is that he's a 70 plus year old man that, that gets most of his information from cable news and reinforces his beliefs through Twitter and, and, and rants on it. Uh, it's frightening to think that someone like that is capable at any moment of ending civilization mm -hmm. as we know it. Uh, and so that reinfor that reinforces the madman strategy. You know, if you, if there is even a doubt that the person on the other end of on the other end of the phone is not a madman. Um, it changes your calculations, but with Trump, we don't we don't know. 
We need to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. An audio version of this show is broadcast three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. We produce Story in the Public Square with a tremendous team of professionals at Rhode Island PBS, and we're grateful to, to them for helping us look and sound good each week, at least as good as we can look. Uh, I'm Jim Lutis, and I run the Pell Center. I run the Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy, a think tank on the campus of Salve Virginia University in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutus. To my right is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller, an accomplished author and an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal. He's at G. Wayne Miller, all one word, on Twitter. And our guest this week is Matthew Galt, a journalist who hosts the War College podcast and whose written work you may have seen in Vice, Reuters, in the New York Times. You can tweet him at MJ Galt, G-A-U-L-T. So we're having a nice little sort of holiday conversation <laughs> about uh, nuclear war. You wrote a, uh, and this is how we found you, you wrote a recent story for War is Boring uh, on the most important films that you thought the president, Donald Trump, should see about nuclear war. Right. So wh what were your top three and what about each of those did you find so compelling that someone who has the power to launch nuclear war maybe should uh, have as a reference point? Uh, two British, one American, uh, chronological order, the, the war game, the day after, and threads. Um, they, the, the kind of the common theme behind all of them, I think, is that they show what happens on the ground in a very real and visceral way when nukes are launched at cities that are just like any city, any, any town USA. Uh, or any town, Britain, as may be the case. War Game, 1966. Uh, it's unlike kind of anything that I had ever seen, especially coming out of the 60s. It's filmed like a documentary. There's no characters. It's just a camera on the ground with a narrator showing you what happens in a, in a small town in Britain when a nuclear blast mm -hmm. goes off nearby. Um, so houses catch on fire. People see the blast and go blind. Society breaks down. Uh, towards the end of the film, bobbies are executing the wounded in the streets. Uh, the, and then you move on to the 80s, where you talk about, or we, we move on to the 80s, and we look at The Day After, which I think is the most important American uh, film in the list. It stars Jason Robards, Steve Gutenberg. It was made for TV, and Ronald Reagan screened it before it went on the air and he wrote in his diary that it depressed him, that it, you know, it, it, it saddened his heart to watch and see what would happen to a small town in Kansas. It's Lawrence, Kansas is where it's set. And it's just like the war game, uh, except because it's an American uh, uh, movie, it's got characters and, and drama. Uh, but the bombs go off. Uh, these people in Lawrence, Cran Lawrence, Kansas struggle to survive. You get to watch Steve Gutenberg uh, die slowly of radiation poison as he, his hair falls out and his flesh bubbles and he, you know, can't go on anymore. Uh, Jason Robards is, is crazed by the end of it, wandering the, the desolate streets populated by all these dead cars just shambling around. Um, and then the, the threads, which is really rough. Uh, it, the BB, it, was an, it was another made-for-TV movie for the BBC, uh, I believe set in Sheffield, small industrial town at the time. Um, and again, f bombs go off, society breaks down, flesh boils. What really is striking about Threads, and I think um, anyone who's seen it does, remembers it, it makes an impression. Uh, you really watch what happens several generations down the line uh, as society breaks down, and you're left with this kind of 14th century style Britain in the end, where one of the main characters who was a, was a young woman who gave birth directly after the bombs fell. You see her daughter uh, in, I can't even call it a hospital, just uh, a, a barren room where other people are sick, also giving birth, and language has fallen away. Um, nobody can write or read anymore. And you see life continue such as it is after the bombs have gone off, and it's horrifying. Is anyone today telling stories like this in any medium, whether it be film or printed medium, or text? Video games. Video games, or? 
Are, are um, there stories of w w w capturing the, the absolute horror of this uh, being told today? In a big in a big way, I don't think yet. Um, we've we've gotten again to you know there's this there's this feedback loop of culture right where public policy kind of feeds into pop culture which feeds back in and we're at this point where I think the 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 horror of this is still so new and still fresh to people my my generation and younger that that stuff is being written now mm -hmm. um, we're not seeing it quite yet but the few things that I have seen. Um, like in Game of Thrones, kind of a, an abstracted version of nuclear weapons. Uh, there was also an SNL skit that was cut for time, actually recently, uh, that dealt with uh, a nuclear missile coming from North Korea and people too distracted to care about care about it. Um, and then there is a video game series uh, that I think does a really good job, especially for people of my generation, uh, and it's called Fallout. And it's a story-driven role-playing game uh, that puts care or that puts the player in charge of a character of their own creation that wanders a wasteland, uh, an American wasteland, a hundred years after the the bombs have dropped. Um, that game, I think, is very important, uh, especially for people of my generation, to help them understand why this stuff is so frightening and important. Because you know, stories are important you know that's why that's why you you have this wonderful show um, in the what really struck me about fallout as I was playing it is it lives in the fear that my parents had and I think that that your generation had of nuclear war uh, and it allows the player to experience it in a way that uh, some of these movies don't don't let them um, so, you know when you get involved in one of these role-playing games that can go on for literally hundreds of hours, you really get a sense and a taste of that world. And, and it's, the, the various games have settings all over the country. Uh, you know, one of the most popular is set in DC. Mm -hmm. and you can wander the DC wasteland and see the landmarks uh, and see what happened to civilization a hundred years after the bombs have dropped. Uh, and I think that the Fallout series is really the only thing going right now uh, that that is really hitting it. I, but I'm willing to bet we're going to see a lot more. I, I remember, uh, so I remember the day after, and I remember being, I was a teenager, and I remember being sufficiently freaked out. Um, the filmmakers who did the day after, who did Threads, who did the war game, you've written that they had political intent. They had a message and an agenda in the stories that they told. They did, they absolutely did. What was it? Uh, <laughs> be afraid, find out what's going on. Ask politicians how these weapons work and why we have them and in, under what situations they're going to be used. Uh, I think the day after and, and the war game in particular are really interesting examples because uh, Peter Watkins, who directed the war game, you know, got about halfway through and then the BBC's uh, management changed and they told him that he probably wasn't going to be able to finish. Hmm. Um, and they, they had been clued in because he'd gone to the civil defense and had been asking questions about how they were going to respond to nuclear war, how does this stuff work. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about it with him and everyone was kind of freaked out. So the BBC watches this movie after he turns it in. It's only 50 minutes long um, and they're like, well, we, we'll never, we're never going to show this. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, you know, this is horrifying. Uh, I can't, we can't, we can't deal with this and they suppress it for 20 years. Mm. It was the mid-80s, uh, in conjunction with Threads, actually, was the first time that the BBC aired it. It did do a number of small screenings, um, just to kind of allay fears, but the public was not allowed to watch it. Um, because there was concern that it was too terrifying because to, it was to too, contemplate. Yeah, and if you, and you, you watch it, um, and you imagine this being on television in the 60s, I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it does not shy away from, from the violence and the gore. Uh, it's very, it's very shocking. Um, the day after, the original cut of it was three hours long, mm -hmm. uh, and the the gentleman who directed it, uh, whose name escapes me, but he also directed uh, Star Trek: The Wrath of Khan and Undiscovered Country, um, thought he'd made a masterpiece. He airs this thing. Uh, the studio executives literally are crying after it's over because they are so shocked and horrified by it, and also tell him that we can't possibly, we can't air this. Uh, but they you know, they fought, they got it down to a two-hour edit, cut out some of the gore, and then sent it to the White House. Um, 
and you know Reagan had a I would call it a positive reaction because he did want people to see it uh, but it depressed him mm -hmm. you know, he got this was a man who understood Hollywood understood public image understood storytelling um, and knew how people would react to that film uh, and even knowing that kind of gave it his 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 blessing uh, and so, yeah, they, they, I think these people, these filmmakers wanted people to understand that we live with a sword of Damocles over the head of, of our entire civilization. We have world-ending capability. We can do that. Um, and it's not going to be over in the blink of an eye. It's going to be protracted and painful and, and ugly. You know, radiation sickness is terrible and if you survive for a long time it will be painful mm -hmm. so this sort of Damocles continues to hang over humanity and we're reading about it in one way or another almost on a daily basis given North Korea and what is happening in Washington is there anyone else in Washington who is raising an alarm who is describing this fear who is as concerned as you are I mean there are many threats to humanity but this is by far the most extreme uh, yes, there are quite a few people who I think have been screaming their heads off for, for years, actually, but are finally getting listened to now. Um, and Jeffrey Lewis, who has the, runs the podcast Arms Control Wonk and does just a bunch of other uh, things, has been watching North Korea for a very long time, has been, uh, has been talking about this. He's absolutely. And, of course, they had, um, there was the recent Senate committee hearing where they were talking about uh, raising concerns over whether or not the president should have the power to deploy these weapons, right. you know, kind of at, at will. Um, so there, we, that's one good thing that's coming out of all of this, is we are now having these discussions again. We are asking ourselves, you know, what is the purpose of these weapons, and how do they function, and, you know, how will they be deployed? So we're not alone. We're going to take yeah. it. We're going to take that at face value and, and leave it there. Uh, Matthew Galt, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, he's Matthew Galt. It's the War College podcast available on all the great outlets for podcasts. We want to thank the audience for joining us this week and every week. If you want to know more about the show or catch up on previous episodes, you can visit us at PellCenter.org, or you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter. He's Wayne. I'm Jim. We hope we'll see you again next week for more Story in the Public Square.